In episode 14 of the Moto Blog, I mentioned art imitating reality, or vice versa. Although it bears many similarities to Dia de los Muertos celebrations elsewhere in Mexico, in Pomuch Campeche, there is one striking difference. Each year, the residents of Pomuch exhume the bones of their dead relatives and lovingly clean them, and while doing so, update the deceased on all the latest family gossip. For the big celebration, their bones are laid out on a special white blanket, embroidered with their name. Then it's back into the ground until next year. To the Western eye, the practice of tending to deceased ancestors' bones seems unorthodox, or possibly just bizarre. It invokes the immediate recognition of the Day of the Dead at first glance. But what if there is more to the story? What if the national celebration itself, not so much these burial rites as seen near Yucatan, but the actual celebration of Dia de los Muertos, what if it were not so Mexican after all? A leading authority on the subject, Stanley Brands, in his book, Skulls to the Living, Bread to the Dead, Brands questions the widespread assumption that signals an essentially distinctive Mexican attitude toward death. Brands' research upends a lot of common misconceptions while he also humbly presents some evidence that casts doubt to the charged question of its origin. It seems the historical foundations of the fiesta may look more like the byproduct of conquest than a cultural relic of the Mesoamerican spirit. Of course, the official Mexican government website disagrees. So does the National Institute of Indigenous People. As you can see, it's recently become a bit contentious. So going back to this idea of art and reality duly reflecting one another, let's consider this first. Movies like Coco and Spectre, a James Bond flick, stand as genuine testaments to this phenomenal dance between art and reality. The question really is not whether it is a dance, but rather, who is the lead dancer? The celebration of Dia de los Muertos, as likely explained from any random person on the street in Mexico City, is actually the culmination and subsequent result of a pinball bouncing between art and reality definitely colliding with the art side more than the reality side. That said, most, including all North Americans, unquestionably accept the tacit suggestion of its bona fide indigenous origin as fact. Let's go back 500 years. Bienvenidos al mercado medieval. <laughs> In colonial times, the Spanish undoubtedly imported their calendar and traditions to Mexico for the indigenous population to adopt at the Spanish behest. The European tradition was inevitably tinged by the indigenous tradition as well. But to what extent? Well, it certainly wasn't to such an extent it reached to the bone. Rather, it seems the truth of the supposed native tradition is about as skin deep as the face paint on a Katrina, a facade painted by hand, but certainly not its soul. At first glance, one would think the Mexican holiday celebration with its sugary Katrinas, Pan de Muerto, Pixar and the 007 movies, and graveyards heavily laden with flowers, yes, all those revered characteristically Mexican things, one would think it was purely indigenous to Mexico at its core, down to the very marrow. Almost as if all these things were metaphysically infused into the skulls we saw in that cemetery. It turns out Mexican intellectuals and artists like Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera made Dia de los Muertos pre-Hispanic and anthropologists later just believed it. We are still led to believe it is actually a domesticated, sanitized, 21st century rendition of a macabre and ancient Mexican ritual formerly soaked in human blood, now rendered benign, acceptable to modern sensibilities. Ooh. In short, it is a popular false notion to think Dia de los Muertos found its origin in an indigenous pagan antecedent. Not only that, but this falsehood was put forth by design. Entertainment, the arts, have more often than not had a revisionist bent. Just look at Disney nowadays. <gasps> I'm here to tell you that's just a facade. A very popular mask even the Mexican government and the National Institute of Indigenous People continue to promote. I will come back to the 19th century revisionists in a bit. Let's first have a look at its food. During the Day of the Dead, one may become familiar with the sweet bread known as pan de muerto. As some may have us believe, the origin of pan de muerto dates back to the Aztecs when human sacrifice was routinely made to keep the sun rising. Supposedly, under the coercion of the disgusted colonizer Cortez and his crew, the Aztecs had to acquiesce to coercion by the Spaniards to replace their custom of biting into a sacrificed victim's heart in a dish of amaranth, kind of like a pre-Hispanic plate of blood sacrifice quinoa to be consumed at the end of November. As the story goes, the Spanish forced them to replace the heart with this pan de muerto, or sweetbread. All that is about as bogus as Quetzalcoatl dressed up as Santa Claus, which was an actual idea floated by the revisionists, by the way. 
Before demystifying all this completely, let's look at the popularized view of the day. Convict entertainer Martha Stewart said, Unequivocally, the sugar skull tradition can be traced back over 3,000 years ago. People in Mesoamerica simply aren't making sweets out of sugar before the Spanish conquest. Food historians point to these sugar skulls originating in the 18th century when Mexico was New Spain. The Spanish showed a particular prowess out of molding foods with bread and marzipan. The pan de muerto is made of wheat, cane sugar, cow's milk, butter, eggs, and an orange zest. All these ingredients together didn't exist in this part of the world in pre-Hispanic times. In medieval Europe, there was a tradition of eating bread on All Saints Day. In chronological order, there was All Hallows' Eve, October 31st, All Hallows' Day, also known as All Saints Day, November 1st, then All Souls' Day, November 2nd. Historically, bread in Europe and in the Christian religion was related to both the divine and death. Formerly in Spain, panes de animas, bread of the deceased or of the dead, were breads that were prepared, blessed, and offered to deceased loved ones during All Saints Day and All Souls Day. They are also known as blessed bread or charity bread. The tradition of mortuary breads in Spain is recorded by the anthropologist Luis de Hoyos Sainz in the publication Spanish Folklore of the Cult of the Dead. He notes that these traditions have gradually ceased to be practiced in Europe. Nowadays, panes de animas have some derivative recipes that have been converted into sweetbreads typical of All Saints Day, such as fogasa in Valencia or panelets in Catalonia. Elsa Malvido, an investigator and historian from Mexico's National Institute of History and Anthropology, has said to continue thinking of Dia de los Muertos as pre-Hispanic in origin means we don't understand anything, for it is deeply Roman. Malvido points to these rituals originating in 10th century France, promoted by the abbot of Cluny, who decided to bring back older beliefs in the Catholic faith. The earliest documented evidence in Mexico of Day of the Dead celebrations is actually found in 19th century newspapers making mention of people going in processions to graves and having drunken parties. Which, by the way, is no different than what was going on in Europe at that same time and date. Just another Catholic ritual, just one of many days on the liturgical Catholic calendar. In the newspaper, there is no mention of this festival being uniquely Mexican or distinct from any other celebration such as Christmas or Easter according to historian Agustin Sanchez Gonzalez. He has a similar view in his article published in the National Institute of Anthropology and History, Archaeología Mexicana. Gonzalez states, even though the indigenous narrative became hegemonic, the spirit of the festivity has far more in common with European traditions of Danse Macabre and their allegories of life and death personified in the human skeleton to remind us of the ephemeral nature of life. Gonzalez explains the indigenous spirit was added to the festivity after the Mexican Revolution as part of a political movement. These Catholic festivals were hijacked and rebranded in the early 20th century to meet political ends. The turning point came in the 1910s thanks to the Mexican Revolution and the cults of the indigenous. The post-revolutionary regime in Mexico saw a succession of generals from the northern province of Sonora who were very anti-clerical and aggressively secular. To them, secularism was synonymous with modernity. Plus, it just so happened it may be helpful in repossessing the church's lands. But hey, that's just the right of conquest, no? Anyways, all was shaken up in Mexico after all those sombreros and mustaches and machine guns. In its new beginning, these generals wanted to reframe or cultivate culture a new idea of Mexico based on indigenous pride, rejecting all things Hispanic and European. They saw all that as too 19th century, i.e. too stuffy, conservative, backwards, and unenlightened. This is perfectly on display in Diego Rivera's History of Mexico painting in the stairwell of the National Palace in Mexico City. Rivera, an atheist and a communist radical, portrays Cortez as a grotesque syphilitic, knobby-kneed and green with the illness. In other words, the commie saw Cortez and the Spanish, as far as he was concerned, as a kind of syphilis infecting the healthy body of the pre-Columbian culture. The iconic Mexican art of Rivera and Frida Kahlo from the 1920s to the 1940s carry strong overtones of the celebration of the indigenous and overt rejection of European influence, from the church to the upper classes. Interesting, we still see this going on today. All of this really comes to a head, or a head of state really, in the person of Plutarco Elias Calles. He was a revolutionary general who once became president following the Mexican Revolutionary War. He went on to implement many populist and secularist reforms, stripping the church of all its corporate existence, real estate, schools, monasteries, convents, 
no foreign priests, no right to defend itself publicly or in the courts, its clergy were forbidden to wear clerical garb, to vote, celebrate public ceremonies, or to engage in politics. Calles was staunchly anti-Catholic. Having nothing to do, I'm sure, with this background as an illegitimate boy scorned by the hierarchy in the church, he founds the Institutional Revolutionary Party, and it holds power for 71 uninterrupted years, starting in 1929. The church was replaced with this cult of the indigenous. They saw Santa Claus as a Yankee, and the Reyes Magos festivity, or the Three Wise Men, as too Spanish. To avoid Yankee cultural imperialism and the Spanish altogether, they actually tried to replace Old Saint Nick with Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent god, to try and teach kids of Mexican indigenous heritage. No kidding, this really happened. Christmas in 1930, Mexico City's National Stadium had a pyramid built in it with a man dressed as the plumed serpent. The 1930s must have gotten weird for everyone, honestly. <laughs> the vacuum created due to the anti-clericalism left much to be desired for the subdued religious longing within. The truth is, there is no neutral for people in spiritual terms. The soul cannot be made zero. It only manifests itself in other ways, whether it be the worship of the state or the self. <laughs> Let's get back to pop culture. The outfit donned by James Bond and Spectre is straight out of the 19th century. The clothing is clearly noticed in Diego Rivera's A Dream of a Sunday Afternoon at Alameda Central Park. It is a 50-foot long painting that is a complex gathering of Mexico's turbulent history. Really a bit of a satirical caricature of the Mexican world before the revolution. The bourgeoisie in their top hats and canes having a walk in the park in Mexico City seem happy and all. But actually, as seen by all the chaos around them, the Inquisitors, Cortez with his bloody hand, gunfire, horses, and mobs. All this is actually going on with these bougie bastards promenading about the park, totally indifferent and seemingly content. Rivera seems to be saying they look dapper and all, but they have death in their souls. Turns out the centerpiece, La Cavalera Catrina, or the Dapper Skeleton, is actually Rivera's tip of the hat to the 19th century cartoon of Mexico's Fond de Siecla elite. The political printmaker Jose Guadalupe Posada originally came up with the Calavera Catrina, as was his style in criticizing the ruling class during the time of the Porfiriato dictatorship, I mentioned in an earlier episode. In the print, La Calavera Garbancera, you can see Posada's disdain for the French, as it is an upper-class woman in a flowery, French-styled hat. Why the anti-French sentiment? Well, they occupied Mexico for a time, and even back in Posada's day, he wasn't all too big on the foreign occupation. However, the Mexican upper-class ladies tended to prefer the French fashion of the 19th century, shedding their Mexican-ness, so to speak, and leaning more toward the French style, including putting on makeup to whiten their faces. Posada didn't care much for that either, so he seems to mock the ladies in his print of La Calavera Garbancera, saying they looked less like the French, but more like skulls. So going back this far, it is reasonable to conclude the Day of the Dead is not only Catholic in origin, but also anti-French. So really, James Bond in that opening scene is dressed as a 19th century political cartoon of an aristocratic Mexican woman. To wrap all this up, let's put it this way. In that opening scene of Spectre, what we're actually seeing is the authentic elements of a medieval Christianity straight out of Europe with an acquired cultural flair propelled by past anti-clericalism from the late 19th and early 20th century. As it turns out, the people in the movie enjoying a procession in Mexico City are actually taking part in a procession that never existed. Yet, the Mexican government seems to love this opening scene. So they had decided that a year after this movie's debut, they launched the first Dia de los Muertos parade in the center of Mexico City, hosting a quarter of a million people, and they've been doing it ever since. So who do you think's leading the dance? Reality or art?